Oh, good morning. It's good to see you and good to be with you again. And uh, from where I was sitting over here in the corner, there's just the gentle drip, drip on the carpet. And I'm sorry. It's just on a day like today, it's actually not. I mean, I know you're going to have to fix the roof. I know that. I know it's good. But it's kind of a nice sound. I've got to be honest with you. It's a pleasant sound. I'm just grateful it's not here. That's all. I'm good with that. That's a blessing. There it is. Back at the uh, beginning of May, we, we began a, a little series entitled Living by Grace, and we, we started by examining our need, our need for grace. Uh, and we took our cue from the grace that was shown to Mephibosheth by King David in 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we found in looking at that story that God delights, he delights to pour out his kindness, his mercy, his grace on those who are his enemies, those who are fearful and helpless, those who are bankrupt and despised. In other words, people just like us. And just as King David did for Mephibosheth, God, by his grace, invites us to be his friends, no longer his enemies. He wants uh, uh, to restore our bankrupt lives. He wants to provide for us all that we need He invites us to eat at his table forever as his sons and daughters. And I think that is uh, uh, something that we anticipate for all eternity, and it's going to be glorious. Today, my wife and I are going to be attending a wedding uh, a little later uh, this afternoon uh, out in Bergen. And I uh, I love, I always loved weddings, but I loved the eating afterwards (laughs) even more than the service. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that this afternoon. But just think of that for all eternity to be seated, seated at, the, at the banquet table of, of the Lamb. And uh, what, a, what a glorious day that will be. God searches for us, uh, like David did for Mephibosheth, and he, and he longs to bring us to his table, to bring us home. And he calms our fears by saying to us, don't be afraid, as David did repeatedly to Mephibosheth. Uh, I discovered some time ago... Uh, a very important, I think a very important biblical fact. I don't know if I shared it with you back then, but let me just remind you. We wonder what is the most common of Bible commands, be holy or be loving or be obedient. No, it's none of those. That's the interesting thing. The, the most common, the most frequent biblical command is do not fear. Do not fear. Don't be afraid. Um, that's because it's God's great desire to show grace not wrath. And it's because our greatest problem is that our sin has twisted our relationship with the one who wants to show us his grace. And it's caused us, our sin has caused us to fear the one who loves us. God keeps reassuring us in his word that he wants to pour blessing And that's why again and again he says throughout the scriptures, fear not, fear not, fear not. Because we all need his grace, but we in our sinful brokenness are afraid to come and to receive what God wants to give us. We need it, but we fear it. And this week I'd like us to consider together some pictures that the Bible gives us of grace. The Bible has some wonderful story pictures of grace, and I want to look at a few of those with you this morning. Someone once said, you know, there's that common expression. It's not a Bible expression, but it's a true expression. A picture is worth a thousand words, and in teaching us about God's, about his grace, God, God not only uses words, he, he, the, the scripture is, is, are full of words of grace, but he also uses pictures. He knew that our minds would struggle to grasp the wonder of his grace. And so he employed every means possible to try and get through to us. There's an old hymn that uh, was quite popular in the years of my youth entitled, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. Maybe some of you know that. The final verse uh, of the hymn has these great words. Wonderful grace of Jesus reaching the most defiled by its transforming power, making him God's dear child. I love the power uh, of, of the words of this hymn, but that line always present me with a slight problem. Well, who is the most defiled that's transformed into God's dear child? Who is the him? Well, it's me. It's you. 
There isn't anybody else who needs God's grace more than you and I. We are the most defiled. We might be tempted to take the words of the song as they stand to refer it. Well, somebody else, you know, somebody that they, they really need grace. But, but like, like Paul, the apostle, I, I think we too need to declare Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. And the hymn writer, the hymn writer understood that truth and and the hymn writer wants us to know that he knew that too because the rest of the verse goes this way, purchasing peace in heaven for all eternity and the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me, me. There's a reason I'm emphasizing the need for us to realize the depth of our need for grace. Because I think it's when we realize how truly hopeless we are, how truly bankrupt we are, uh, how truly empty we are without his grace, that's when, when grace appears with wonder in our eyes. And I think we only see that true wonder when we see it against the backdrop of, a, of the desperateness of our sinfulness. And the Bible is clear about the totality of our ruin. Our ruin is total. Our, our family has uh, lived in Alberta now for just over 30 years. We, we came in uh, January of 19... 19- 92. And uh, we moved here from Ontario. Uh, and one of my earliest memories was just in the early weeks back in January of that year of come, walking home from a Bible study uh, at night. And I looked up into the clear, cold, cloudless night sky and I, I was just arrested by the stars. I hadn't seen stars with that brilliance for, for many, many years. The night sky was so black, the stars were so bright against it that it literally took my breath away. I just stood there looking up for a few moments. Now the stars are there all the time. They're there right now. But we only see them at night when the blackness shows them for their true wonder. In Ontario, where we were from, the sky was often a little cloudy, a little hazy with humidity, and and the stars, they just didn't shine the way they shone, shone that night in southern Alberta. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, The Word of God gives us the totality of our ruin, the record of our darkness. Our ruin is complete. Our sin is black, if you will. Our situation was hopeless. Listen to Paul's words as he wrote to the believers in the city of Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 1, or chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We were dead. Before we came to know God, we were dead in our sins. We were dominated We were under the dominion of Satan, the prince of the power of the air. We were disobedient. Our lives were marked by disobedience against God's will. We were depraved. Our behavior was depraved as we were driven by our sinful passions and desires. And we were doomed. We were doomed for destruction by the righteous wrath of God against our sin. Our ruin was total. And then two words entered our lives entered the universe, and everything changed but God. Our ruin is total, but his remedy is complete. But God swept in, and the stars began to shine. But God, we read in verse 4, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
but God. Those two little words. That's really the summation of the gospel. But God, despite the darkness of our destiny, God broke in and he delivered us from certain destruction. We were dead, but God raised us from the dead when Jesus rose from the dead. We were dominated, but God seated us with Christ and gave us authority to resist Satan. We were disobedient, but God, by his grace, brought forgiveness through Jesus into our lives. We were depraved, but God recreated us with new hearts and minds to accomplish good things in the name of Jesus. We were doomed, but God, because of our faith in Christ, will show us his kindness in the coming ages forever. We've been delivered. God's grace has redeemed our past, our present, and our future. I don't know if you've seen the Tolkien movies, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I read the books in high school, and I've seen the cartoons and watched the movies. I, I'm, I love J.R.R. Tolkien's work. And uh, the film version of The Two Towers... Uh, has a moment when it seems as if everything is going to end. Uh, Helm's Deep, where people have gone for protection, seems to just about ready to fall. The orcs, if you know, you know, never mind. <laughs> just, just take my word for it. If you haven't seen it, there's bad guys. They call them orcs, okay? And they're, they're about to break it in the defense, and the human defenders are behind the walls, and they've given up hope, and everything is hopeless. And then... A horn sounds, and the good guy, Gandalf the Grey, appears with a host of warriors and sweeps the enemy from the field, la, la, la. It's the same old story. The cavalry comes to the rescue at the last minute, that kind of thing. New twist, old story. The message of God's grace is is held in that little phrase, but God. At the moment when all seems lost, but God comes to our rescue. And he deals decisively with our sin problem He deals with our past, our present, and our future. Everything changes in a moment. What does God do with our sin? Here are four pictures that I want to share with you. God has has swept in. We're no longer enemies. We're friends. We no longer need to fear him, although we do. We have his peace. He's promised us. We are no longer hopeless We have eternal life. We are no longer bankrupt. We have the riches of Christ. We are no longer despised. We are his beloved children. Everything has changed. These four word pictures that the Bible paints picture the decisiveness of that change. And if you're a believer in Jesus this morning, but if you continue to struggle with fear or with hopelessness, or a sense that God is against you and that perhaps that you're worthless or bankrupt, please fix these, these four-word pictures in your heart and mind. Put these pictures, if you will, on the refrigerator of your soul. We all have pictures on those refrigerators of things that, and the people that are important to us. And sometimes we put up scripture verses or truths that we want to remind ourselves of. Well, Put these pictures, wherever it is in your life, that will remind you of the central truths that God wants you to know. They will change the way you think and feel about yourself as you come to believe that they really represent God's grace for you. Picture number one, but God has taken away our sin as far as the east is from the west. And I think I'm pointing in the right direction. The psalmist wrote, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Just think about the globe for a moment with me. Um, If you set on a journey to the North Pole, which I think is that direction, you'll eventually cross the crowd of the earth and you'll begin to head south. And and again, if you go the other way and you, you head south, you'll eventually cross the crown and head north. But if you head west and keep on going, you'll never actually reach the east. And if you head east and keep on going, you will actually never get to the west either. What this word picture is designed to tell us is that God's forgiveness is infinite. Infinite. God's forgiveness is total. It is complete. He has taken our sin so far away from us that it is no longer attached to us or associated with us. 
It is removed completely. It will never appear again in his accounting of our lives. It's gone. But the sad reality is that some of us live as if the text said, as far as the north is from the south. It's really far, but it's still within reach. If he wanted to, he could, well, he could bring it up and he could hold it against us. No. Deliverance from sin through Christ is complete. Picture number one. Picture number two. But God has hidden our sin behind his back. Prophet Isaiah was, was extolling the grace of God. Again, these are wonderful words, but they create a picture. But in love, you have delivered my life from the pit of destruction. For you have cast all my sins Behind your back. Wow. Now it's not that we don't sin. But God takes them and he places them behind his back. If we're in Christ. If we're in Christ and our sin has been atoned for, he takes them and he places them behind his back so that he can't see them anymore, so that they do not get in the way between us. Think of how big God's back must be. And when our sin is there, it's gone. It's out of view. And it's again not that our sin isn't dealt with. It's dealt with at the cross of Christ once and for all. And because of that, God chooses not to let it stand between him and us. And it's not that God ignores our sin. When we have received his forgiveness through Christ, he chooses not to hold our sin against us or to see us through him. He sees us instead through the righteousness of Christ. In May of uh, 1987, Wilhelmina Timersma, um, an organist at the Unitarian Church in Quebec City, set the church on fire. She was deeply depressed. She was um, deeply depressed about various things in her life, and, and she wanted to die. And so she, uh, she set the church on fire. It represented the important things in her life. But after setting the church on fire, she, she fled. But the results of the fire were tragic. Two firefighters died in the blaze that destroyed the church, and three others were seriously injured. And although Timersma fled the building, she soon returned to awaken the building superintendent and his family who lived adjacent to the church so that they could escape. And then she held the doors of the building open so the firefighters could move in and out with their hoses. And then she walked to the police station and she confessed. She pled guilty to criminal negligence causing death and she served about three years. And after she was released in 1991, a neighboring church, Christ Church Cathedral, an Anglican church in downtown Quebec City, invited her to give a series of organ recitals during the season of Lent. That's the season preceding Easter. And the music director of Christ Church Cathedral, Gerald Wheeler, explained their reason for doing so. He wrote, we believe through our discussions with her, which have gone on for a long period of time, that she is truly repentant for the things that she did in the past, and therefore we believe that the time for reconciliation has come. Lent in our church is a time of repentance and forgiveness. We think it's a good time for her to play. I love this next line. Frankly, he wrote, we believe she is an organist, not an arsonist. God declares us to be his beloved children. And he no longer sees us in the clothing of our sin, but dressed in the righteousness of Christ. We are his children. Our sinful, dirty clothes are behind his back. And he sees us clean and holy in Christ. We're sinners, but God says, no, you're children. Picture three. But God has blotted out our record through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord, our Redeemer and Savior, declared this, I, I am he. And I just want you to just... That statement, I, I am he, God is establishing this is who I am. You know that phrase. 
in the Gospel of John, repeat it again and again, I am. I, from the book of Exodus, I am. That's God's identity. This is who I am. This is my name. This is my person. This is, this is my essential being. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sin. That's who our God is. A pardoning, forgiving God. Before he became a Christian, Bob Sheffield played professional hockey here in Canada. He, he, was, he, was a, he was one of those enforcer guys. And he found himself in jail one night after a barroom brawl. And uh, later, he and his wife became believers. They uh, were involved with a ministry called the Navigators. It's a disciple-making ministry that's uh, had a tremendous impact in Canada and the United States, in fact, around the world. And they as- accepted a temporary assignment from Canada to the United States with the Navigators. And in order to take the uh, position, Bob had to apply for landed immigrancy in the United States. Um, but because he had a criminal record because of that barroom brawl, his request for landed immigrancy was denied in the United States. And so they decided to apply for what we call a queen's pardon. And after a very thorough examination of his life and of the situation of the, of, uh, the case and, and his subsequent life after his conviction and, and uh, jail time, the pardon was granted. And eventually Bob received in the mail the declaration of the pardon. And this is in part what it wrote, what it said. Whereas we have sit, and this is from the, from the crown, Whereas we have since been implored on behalf of the said Robert Jones Sheffield to extend a pardon to him in respect to the convictions against him, and whereas the Solicitor General here submitted a report to us, now know ye therefore, having taken these things into consideration, that we are willing to extend the royal clemency on him, the said Robert J. Sheffield, we have pardoned, remitted, and released him of every penalty to which he was liable in pursuance thereof. And so on any document from that time forward on on, on which Bob was asked if he had a criminal record, he could say, no. No, I don't. The pardon meant that he was released from any possible punishment. The record, in fact, was expunged, erased. Brothers and sisters, the King of Kings has declared a pardon for us in Christ. We are set free from any penalty or punishment in pursuance thereof for what we have done. When asked about our record of sin, the answer is no record. Pardoned by the blood of Christ. Clean. Picture number four. But God has hurled all our sin into the sea. In the concluding words of his prophecy, the prophet Micah declared his wonder at the mercy and grace of God. He wrote, who is a God like you? Who is a pardoning God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. When you throw something into the sea, generally speaking, it's gone. People are still searching. I know stuff comes to light every now and then, but people are still searching eight years later for the wreckage of Malaysian Air Flight 370, the flight that went down somewhere in the sea off Australia. They're still looking for it. Despite every possible technological uh, uh, tool being applied to that, to that search. It took decades, decades of dedicated searching for people to find the Titanic, even though they had a general idea of where it went down in the, in the Atlantic. But when God throws something into the sea, there are no maps, there are no directions given. It's gone. Irretrievably, irreversibly gone. All gone. The sea of God's mercy is big enough to hold everything he throws into it and deep enough to hide it forever. Pastor Lee Strobel shares uh, this account of of a service at the church where he served. We were doing a baptism service, he wrote. We told people before they came 
to the platform to be baptized, to take a piece of paper and to write down a few of the, a few of the sins that they'd committed and, and then to fold the paper. And on the platform, there was a, a large wooden cross. And we instructed the candidates to take that piece of paper, take a pin, and to pin it to the cross because the Bible says our sins are nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ and are fully paid for by his death. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, by the way. Colossians 2, verse 14. And after doing that, they were to turn and then come to the pastor to be baptized. And Strobel shared a letter written by one of the candidates. It was a woman who wrote this. I remember my fear. In fact, it was the most fear I remember in my life. I wrote as tiny as I could on that piece of paper the word, I'm not going to tell you. I just invite you to fill into that blank whatever you might write on that paper if you were the candidate that day. She wrote, I was so scared someone would open the paper and read it and find out it was me. I wanted to get up and walk out of the auditorium during the service. The guilt and the fear were that strong. When my turn came, I walked toward the cross and I pinned the paper there. I was directed to a pastor to be baptized. He looked me straight in the eyes and I thought for sure that he was going to read this terrible secret I kept from everybody for so long, but instead, I felt like God was telling me, I love you. It's okay. You've been forgiven. I felt so much love for me, a terrible sinner. It's the first time I ever really felt forgiveness and unconditional love. It was unbelievable. It was indescribable. Now, you know, baptism tanks are just a, they're just a couple of feet deep. But that baptismal water represents the vastness of God's ocean of forgiveness. It, it can hold all our iniquities, every one of them. And the blood of Jesus Christ washes away the stain. Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Have you accepted God's offer of grace and forgiveness in Christ? If you have, if you have, then your sin and failure is, it's out there somewhere beyond where the West ends. He no longer attaches it to you. It's gone. Your sin is hidden from view behind the back of God. He no longer sees it when he looks at you. It's been wiped from his books. There's no record of it anywhere to be held. It's buried in the depths of the ocean of his forgiveness. It's never going to surface again. Do you believe it? Does your heart believe it? It's God's word to you. You're no longer God's enemy. You're his friend. You no longer need to fear him. You have his peace. You are no longer hopeless. You have eternal life. You're no longer bankrupt. You have the riches of Christ. You are no longer despised. You are beloved. Wonderful, the matchless grace of Jesus. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountains. Sparkling like a fountain. All sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions. Greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Praise his name. And to God be the glory. Amen. God bless you.